Good morning, everyone. This is Barry Knapp with Ironsides Macroeconomics. It's Monday morning, June 28th. For those of you who see this in video form, you'll see I have a suit and tie on. I'm fresh off a CNBC appearance at 7 a.m. Eastern this morning. Um, this is our weekly podcast referencing a note we released on the 26th in our marquee product, which is our written product titled Better Left Unsaid. This will also be our video produced by our friends at Nucle uh, Nucleus 195. And um, uh, ultimately, we'd love you to subscribe to our podcast and um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, listen to our podcast, watch our videos. But our marquee product is indeed our written product. And so we'd love you to consider subscribing to that. Um, it is uh, filled with specific recommendations, the charts, the tables, and uh, um, that's what we put the bulk of our, our effort into. So four topics to discuss this week. The first one is the Fed's reaction function. We then go on to discuss monetary policy shocks in the QE era. Um, we've got a third section on inflation dynamics, summarizing our uh, all of what we've some of what we've written anyway about inflation, but trying to put it together in a broad uh, intermediate and long-term perspective. And then finally, um, a section on uh, GSEs, Fannie and Freddie and uh, banks, the bank stress test. So beginning with um, the title of the note, Better Left Unsaid, market participants were parsing Fed speak last week. Um, you know, they've gone to their corners in, in one respect, the Hawks, Kaplan and Bullard, um, I suppose Bostic is uh, talking about being ready to withdraw stimulus. Rosengren is concerned about the housing market. Um, uh, Mester was somewhere in the center. The Doves, coincidentally, are all uh, seem to emanate from the West Coast. Um, uh, Mary Daly and, and uh, John Williams, who's now the president of the New York Fed, are in the Dovish camp. We thought that the leadership was notable in their letting the hawkish pivot stance. Now, Bill Dudley, who was part of the leadership when he was president of the New York Fed, described the leadership as the president of the New York Fed, that's Williams, uh, the vice chair for monetary policy, Clarida, and, and uh, of course, Chairman Powell. We think that Leo Brainerd is part of that leadership group as well, given the politics uh, of this and, and her status as the likely um, successor to, uh, to Jerome Powell. That notwithstanding, Powell was very noncommittal in his testimony, and uh, we didn't hear from Clarida or Brainerd. Um, so that to us was somewhat notable. But really what's important here is thinking about the Fed's reaction function. And that brings us to this week's payroll report, which we think is absolutely crucial <clears throat> as in, in determining whether they're going to start reducing the asset purchases in the near term. Um, an inline number, 700,000 jobs or so, uh, another significant increase in average hourly er earnings, even more importantly, um, the consensus seems to be switching back and forth between three tenths and four tenths, but four tenths after coming from a five tenths of a percent and seven tenths of a percent increase the last two months would be fairly significant. Uh, and probably nudge the Fed towards withdrawing some of this stimulus, cutting the asset purchases, that is. And of course, the various participation rates of all the inclusive groups, what's happening with prime age women, uh, some of the minority groups, uh, less skilled workers and the like, those things are all important. We'll obviously have a note go out shortly after that, uh, even on your 4th of July holiday. Um, and the housing market is critical here too. Williams was very dismissive of the role of asset purchases on the housing market. He views it as just um, loosening overall financial conditions. We think that that is, uh, is just wrong, um, that it is indeed turbocharging the housing market. We've written a lot about that. And uh, obviously there's some other Fed governors I've already referenced, Kaplan, Bullard, Rosengren, that have specifically spoken about that. And I do think that will probably gain some momentum on the committee. Um, so this Friday's report is, is pivotal, and you can think about it uh, in the old, uh, good is probably going to be bad for equity investors this go around. A strong number is probably a negative for equity. So um, one other final point, obviously, there was on policy, at least, there was a big discussion about um, uh, infrastructure last week. There's a bipartisan deal that may or may not be tied to doing the American Families Plan. 
the additional spending is coming one way or another. And as we've written, we've had five consecutive lows for the treasury market in the summer, generally in August or early September. We think that's coming again. They are going to spend some more money. The market is going to need to reprice. That's the very, that will influence the back end of the treasury market, 20 to 30 year bonds. Um, and uh, that could very well happen at the same time that the Fed is reducing some of the, the purchases in the intermediate part of the curve. Remember they're their QE purchases, average duration is six years and a newly issued mortgage is something like seven. So <clears throat> we could get a fairly significant move in the rates market um, coming later in the summer. And, uh, and that could lead to a pretty good risk off shock, which brings us to the second section, which is what happens <clears throat> when you get these policy normalization related uh, shocks pre global financial crisis and post global financial crisis pre global financial crisis there was generally one per cycle a couple of of cycles had had more but they averaged about 8% corrections in the S&P 500 after the global financial crisis they averaged more like 14 and the four of the five largest ones came when the fed was reducing mortgage purchases after having bought something like a third of uh, the total size of the agency mortgage-backed securities market, and generally about 100% of net supply. The end of QE1, that was true of QE2, and then during the balance sheet contraction in 2018. The Fed is going to need to get out of those mortgage pur purchases. 13% annualized house price gains is pricing uh, millennials who are now forming households out of the market. They need to reduce that stimulus but there's no way to get around having a fairly good size risk off shock. Um, there's plenty more details in the note around all this. So moving on to uh, inflation dynamics, we began with a little bit of an anecdotal story. We were at the NAB, National Association of Business Economists um, conference right before the pandemic lockdowns hit. And we had a breakout dinner with a former Fed staffer who had been at the board and been in the New York Fed. And he was talking about the inflation outlook at the time. Uh, he said that um, the, in essence, his assertion was that the three decades of disinflation were largely attributable to Fed credibility. That is better policy. We sort of did a double take and then asked him about all the deregulatory policy that began under Carter, accelerated under Reagan. Uh, he was totally dismissive of that. We asked him about globalization and the effect of integrating 700 million Chinese into a global supply chains, and he was dismissive of that as well. <clears throat> um, that, to us, is the explanation for three decades of, uh, of disinflation. And so when we think about our longer-term inflationary outlook, restructuring supply chains is absolutely number one. Where the debt resides is completely different this cycle versus the end of the global financial crisis. Financial crises generally do lead to a decade of disinflation. The debt was at the household and financial sector level back in 2009. Now it's all at the government level. That leads to inflation, not deflation. We had a shale oil shock last cycle. We're not having one of those this go around. Uh, the benefits of technology integration into delivery of consumer products and services, we believe has evolved from focused primarily on price, getting consumers a cheaper price, to now being more about convenience. So we don't think that will <clears throat> be as much as a, of a disinflationary influence. And then the fact that we have very accommodative fiscal and monetary policy, and we're like to have, likely to have an even more dovish Fed through this business cycle as the Fed gets reconstituted under the Biden administration. All those things are our case for longer term, uh, a new inflation regime initially. Reflation, maybe inflation after that. Um, finally, a quick comment on the, <clears throat> pardon me, the core PCED release on Friday. It continues to show very tame housing and medical care inflation. That's not gonna persist. What we think will happen is those will recover, some of the supply chains will clear, so the correlation of the components will remain relatively low through the balance of this year. But next year, we'll see correlation push up, and you'll see that from us. We've created a big correlation matrix of the components of, uh, of inflation. When that starts to move, that'll be your best sign that these macro factors are starting to influence prices, and we really have moved into a, um, a reflation regime. So... Uh, wrapping up this week's note was a bit of a discussion about the GSEs. We had a Supreme Court decision that allowed 
uh, President Biden to fire Mark Calabria, formerly of, uh, of um, the uh, Cato Institute. We thought he was trying to do the right thing in terms of um, reducing Fannie and Freddie's footprint in the housing market. We've had a de facto government takeover of the housing market. Jeannie May owns the subprime market. Fannie and Freddie own <clears throat> um, the, uh, the higher quality part of the market. And, uh, and that's just not where we should have been going with um, GSEs and the government's involvement in the housing market because we trace really Fannie and Freddie's role to the subprime crisis. Um, from 2003 to 2008, they bought the bulk of the AAA tranche, the non-economic tranche of every subprime CDO deal that got done. They were the only ones who could do it because they had 60 turns of leverage, twice as much as uh, the over-leveraged broker-dealers. We worked at one of them. And um, they also used that as a way to get around their Community Reinvestment Act uh, guidelines. And so the Fannie and Freddie were not they were they were part a big part of the problem, and we should have been trying to reduce their their um, involvement in the market. And instead, we're going to go the other way now under the Biden administration. Um, as to the banks, we got the stress test results on Thursday. We're going to get the buyback announcements tonight. the The bank story is proceeding well. Their credit cycle has improved. <clears throat> the new Cecil accounting standard meant that they reserved more probably than they needed to against losses early in the pandemic. They're now releasing those reserves. That money can go into buyback stock. It's been buying treasuries. But a chart that we produced in our weekly showed the, the change in bank asset mix from private sector lending to government securities <clears throat> purchases. That is financial repression. Ultimately, the banks are going to need lo to loan money to the private sector or the sector will not work through the cycle. It'll work for the next quarter or two. It's still cheap. We like it, but we need an asset mix change to come about. So um, bank earnings, by the way, are coming up in a couple of weeks' time. So that was part of the reason for uh, delving into that on our note this week. So all in all, uh, we'll be focused on Friday's payroll report. It's a big deal for getting to this Fed policy normalization-related correction. We'd still be selling into um, strength here, trying to raise some cash because we do think a decent risk-off uh, episode is uh, on its way. Have a good week, everyone, and uh, happy 4th of July. Barry Knapp, Ironsides Macroeconomics. Please subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, and by all means, consider becoming a full subscriber to our research.